go beyond. Hence a socialism that emphasizes worker co-ops because that is the alternative to master slave, lord, serf, or employer, employee, because it finally brings democracy into the workplace, which I would argue was Marx's intent all along, at least in the sense that I make uh, of his thinking. Final point. Uh, my family is by origin German. German is my first language. I'm fluent in German. And I have studied German history all my life. Uh, I don't understand uh, what Dr. Friedman said uh, about Germany. East Germany was a backward rural part, an agrarian backwater. All capitalist development in Germany had taken place in the West. And when you cut that country in half at the end of World War II, you took the advanced industrial Western part and made it West Germany and an old rural Junker class, rural backward area. For communists, this is the reverse of the way things should have gone. And that has to be factored in to their different performances without, again, as with China, making this nice, neat story of capitalism good and socialism bad. For me, socialism is a radically democratic reorganization of production. Whether the worker co-ops use market mechanisms to deal with one another, interspersed with non-market mechanisms, and I agree with Dr. Friedman, it's usually a mix, is a much secondary question to the radical social transformation that would occur if socialists had their way and made the democratic worker co-op the core production organization. Happily, that is already present in the world. And for those of you that are interested, the most successful example is the Mondragon Corporation in Spain. The second most successful example is the 40% of the economy of Emilia Romagna, a province in Italy, where you can see how worker co-ops function and have functioned for many, many decades, so that the reality of them as a real alternative to capitalism is plentiful for anyone interested in looking at it. I'll stop there. Thank you. All right, and um, you had uh, two minutes left. Are you? Do you want to keep going, or do you want to yield that time? No, let me let me keep going because being <coughs> been a, a mathematician before I became an economist, uh, I like to make this point uh, when these kind of issue arises. In mathematics, we, we have a concept called infinity. When we, when we really don't know, when things are so numerous, there's so many, we kind of signal it by taking the number eight and putting it over on its side and saying there's an infinity. Well, here's the problem. Every act of, the, of life, human life or any other, has an infinity of consequences. Those that we know and those that we don't. Those that happen in the present and those that happen in an unknowable future. Therefore, the notion that we can measure the benefits, that's the good outcomes, against the costs, that's the bad outcomes, is absurd because you can't measure an infinity, especially when parts of it are unknown, unconscious, and in the future. So One minute. the notion that we're gonna measure the costs and benefits of anything is a conceit. We don't have that capacity. That's like saying we're going to fly over the Empire State Building. We're not going to do that no matter how long we practice. It's not going to happen. And we know it. And we know from mathematically, we don't know what all the consequences are. Every act of an economic actor has consequences, costs they're not bearing or even know about, and benefits they're not bearing or even know about. Number two, whatever consequence you think what you're looking at had, I got news for you. Other influences also made that thing happen. You can't separate out what your object of analysis, what, what it contributed versus 800 other things. Therefore, you can't measure costs and benefits that way either. Bottom line, it's not an exception to the market that it has externalities. It's in the nice. nature of the market. It never can manage all of that, and it never did. 
All right. Thank you very much. Um, that was a wonderful 20 minute openings from both parties. And now uh, we're going to go for our 10 minute rebuttal uh, first to Dr. David Friedman, and then we will return to Dr. Wolf for another 10 minutes. So uh, David Friedman, you have 10 minutes starting now. Thank you. I noticed that uh, Dr. Wolf uh, spent 20 minutes without ever telling us what he means by socialism, other than it's good and it somehow has to do with worker democracy. Uh, but he did raise that it seems to be an interesting question, uh, and that is uh, the question of whether uh, democracy is, a, is, is the good thing. And uh, there's a famous quote attributed to Churchill that democracy is the worst way, form of government ever invented by the mind of man, except for all the others that have been tried from time to time. And people usually take that as an endorsement of democracy, but I take that as a critique of government. What it is saying is that the least bad way of running government works very badly. And I think that applies much more broadly, that I don't think democracy is the way you want to run an economy. The way you want to run an economy is what I have sometimes described as competitive dictatorship. That is to say, the way we run restaurants and hotels. I have no vote at all on what is on the menu of the restaurant, but I have an absolute vote on whether I'm the one who, who goes to it. Similarly, if you think about how an actual capitalist system, including the firms that Professor Wolf dislikes actually works, those decisions are not really being made by the CEO. CEO can decide to produce something, but if the customers don't want to buy it, they don't buy it. And if he keeps making decisions the customers don't like, the, the result is that his company goes out of business or he gets fired. Uh, similarly, he can make decisions about the workers, but if the decisions are not offering the workers terms on which will, they're willing to work, he doesn't have any workers. That for some reason, Professor Wolf seems to be imagining that uh, the fact that in, if you don't reach an agreement with somebody in a voluntary trade, you don't make the trade amounts to compulsion. I'm curious as to whether Professor Wolf thinks that this debate should have been arranged by democracy. Uh, should the decision of whether or not he would come have been made by a vote of all of the people who might watch it, or should it have been made an absolute dictatorship by him? just as I had an absolute dictatorship on whether I came and the people running this had an absolute dictatorship on that. So I would have said that a system in which each pe person makes decisions for himself and you then get coordination by voluntary agreement among them, which of course means that anybody can prevent anybody else from doing something if that something depends on that particular person uh, cooperating. Uh, the, the, when, you, when you propose to a woman, she has an absolute mon monopoly. We don't have a democratic system for deciding who she, who she gets married, uh, and we shouldn't. Uh, let me keep on, let me say a little bit about workers' co-ops, because they are, in fact, an interesting institution. And I don't know why Professor Wolf neglected to mention the largest, the largest scale real example, and that was communist Yugoslavia because in communist Yugoslavia, you had a largely market framework in which the firms were workers' co-ops rather than the kind of firm that Professor Wolf doesn't like. Uh, it worked, I would say, substantially better than uh, the centrally planned communism of the Soviet Union, uh, with the result that people in Yugoslavia were somewhat better off. Uh, but it worked substantially worse than capitalism in places like Italy and Austria, uh, which were nearby and similar. I noticed Professor Wolf wants to uh, eliminate my, ev my evidence for Germany uh, because conveniently enough, he can explain it away, but he has to explain away all my other cases as well. Uh, and as far as I can tell, implicit in his initial talk is that the reason that he doesn't want to accept socialism is actually practiced as evidence is it worked badly. And therefore he ignores the multiple cases where you had fairly close parallels. Taiwan was not a richer place than, than China. Singapore was a less rich. They had a, the poor workers who fled there essentially. Uh, and yet it did very much better than, than China under, under Mao. Uh, let me now say a little bit more about workers' co-ops. They're not a new idea. My favorite one is the Oneida Commune in the 19th century New York, which was a group family, a group marriage, as well as a commune. Uh, it worked for one generation and then collapsed when the founder, the charismatic founder, pulled out. Uh, one of his sons took over, restructured it as the Oneida Corporation, which to this day makes silverware. 
that was an example of, of, of an experiment. I discussed the idea of workers owning their firms back in my first book almost 50 years ago. I did some calculations on how, how many years it would take for workers to choose to live at a very, very bare bone standard, sort of beans and rice standard, uh, in order to accumulate the money to buy their firms and concluded that it would be an awful lot easier than running a socialist revolution. And yet very, very few of them do. It cap happens occasionally, but not very often. I would like to point out that workers' co-ops are not an egalitarian system. They may be democratic within the co-op, but some workers' co-ops will be successful, some will be failure, and the result is you have an unequal distribution of income. Workers' co-ops may discover I think usually do discover that having democratic votes on anything, everything works very badly. And so they eventually democratically decide to appoint a manager who they can democratically remove if they, if they feel like it. Same system used by 18th century pirate ships. Incidentally, the captain was elected by majority vote and could be removed by majority vote, captain and quartermaster. It's one of the chapters of the book of mine that I published not too long ago. Uh, but uh, they usually will find that somebody is much better at managing than everybody else. And if they have a very good manager, they may also find they've got to pay him more than everybody else in order to keep some other co-op from hiring him away. So there is nothing particularly egalitarian about that system. It is indeed democratic at the level of the firm, but I would much prefer freedom to democracy, that democracy includes the possibility of 55% enslaving the other 45 Talking about slaves, uh, I should have made it more explicit in my explanation of capitalism that part of that private property system was that each individual belongs to himself. And I omitted that, and you are perfectly legitimate in calling me on on on, legitimate, on, 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 on omitting that. So a private, so a capitalist, a, a slave system, like everything else, has some mix of capitalist and socialist elements but the slavery itself is not part of a capitalist market because the slave owner doesn't have to take account of, of costs and benefits to the slave. Uh, however, a employer does have to take a, a account of costs and benefits to his employees because the employees have the option of working somewhere else. Uh, he has to take account of costs and benefits to the suppliers of his other inputs for essentially uh, the, the, same, the same reason. Uh, so what I observe is that uh, Professor Wolf wants to define away or explain away the mass of evidence we have that socialism in the form it was actually advocated and practiced in the 20th century worked catastrophically badly. I should say he's wrong about the Soviet Union as it happens. The high growth rate of the Soviet Union was an artifact of the fact that the Soviet Union was controlling the statistics. We now know, if you actually observe, you must you ought to consider that Japan was as cheap, was as poor as Russia at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, Japan, nonetheless, uh, it ended up a great deal richer than Russia by the time that communism collapsed. There were other countries. Uh, Taiwan was poorer probably than Russia at the beginning of the 20th century, and it ended up much richer at the end. So, and in fact, if you look at Russian economic growth in a 20 or 30 years before the communists took over, it was growing relatively rapidly. It was still quite a poor country. Uh, but the idea that the Soviet economic growth uh, was enormous, you know, maybe you made the mistake of reading Samuelson's textbook. As you may know, Samuelson, for edition after edition, claimed the Soviet Union was outgrowing the U.S. about two to one. Edition after edition, he had the date at which the lines would cross, at which the Soviet GNP would pass the U.S. GNP. And edition after edition, that year st crept steadily ahead at about the rate at which time was passing because in fact, the Soviet Union was not growing faster. Uh, Samuelson was mistaken. He was observing that the Soviet Union invested a larger fraction of his GNP and ignoring the fact that it matters how you invest things, whether in things that actually work or, or, or don't work. Uh, I was also surprised a little by the claim that markets are not part of production because the way production One is minute. organized in a market system is indeed by the market. The GM does not have its own steel mills. It doesn't have, it probably doesn't have its own glass factories. Uh, it has to coordinate with the other people involved in that very elaborate productive activity. Uh, if, I don't know if uh, 
Professor Wolf, as a socialist economist, has or hasn't studied conventional price theory, but there really is a useful way in which markets provide signals of costs and benefits to people, and they're not perfect signals, but most of the costs that I impose when I do something are costs on the market that I've got to pay for, uh, and most of the benefits for most, not all things, are, are benefits on the market that I get paid for. Thank you. I think that probably covers uh, the point.